Now you should make sure that you watch the video on Valley Forge before you do this reading because that's the situation that the troops were in. So make sure that you're familiar with that. Now this again was written by Thomas Paine, same person who wrote Common Sense. We read some of that uh, in the last lesson. Um, but this is a, from a pamphlet that Thomas Paine wrote called The Crisis. <clears throat> and in The Crisis he outlined the situation that he thought America was in and why it was so important for America to conquer during the Revolutionary War. And again, this was hugely influential. Everybody read it. Um, it was uh, very influential in getting people to push forward through these times that were really hard. This is really the dark crisis part of the Revolutionary War when it looks like things are going to go horrible for the colonies. So let's read this and, um, and uh, pay attention to how he describes this and how he motivates the people to be brave and uh, to push forward even in these times. So uh, let's read along. I'm going to read and we'll stop and talk about it a little bit here and there. So he says... These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. So again, he's playing to their sense of accomplishment and, uh, and uh, that the, if you work hard now, you will come out conquerors on what will be remembered as one of the great triumphs, like conquering hell. He compares it to conquering hell. If we can conquer this, we will be heralded as great heroes by those who come after us. So going on, what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. So he says, if this is really something that's worth sacrificing for, then this must be a glorious blessing coming up. So because there's this glorious blessing, it does take a big sacrifice right now. Um, that sacrifice somehow will bring these great blessings to us. So what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. If this was easy, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't think that it was all that great a thing, that freedom is such that great a thing. But because this is hard, our freedom will be very valuable and dear to us. Uh, it is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price on its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Again, because freedom is such a valuable prize, it comes at a great cost, is what he's saying. Britain, with an army to enforce her tyranny, has declared that she has a right not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. And if being bound in that manner is not slavery, then there is not such a thing as slavery upon earth. Even the expression is impious. For so unlimited a power can belong only to God. So he's talking about Britain has taken upon itself the power to control us like slaves. And no one has that power except for God. So it is our right to stand up and defend ourselves and to earn our freedom. <clears throat> Going on. I have as little superstition in me as any man living, but my secret opinion has ever been, and still is, that God Almighty will not give up a people to military destruction or leave them unsupportedly to perish, who have so earnestly and so repeatedly sought to avoid the calamities of war by every decent method which wisdom could invent. So here he is um, saying that he believes, it is his belief, that uh, God will help them in this matter because they tried, remember the events leading to the revolution, they really did try to talk and work things out with Great Britain and only when it got so bad did they decide to declare their independence. He said, because we worked so hard at this and tried our best not to have war, now we can rely on the power of God to help protect us that God will support us in this thing that we're doing, is his opinion. Going on. Neither have I so much of the infidel in me as to suppose that he has relinquished the government of the world and given up the care, uh, and given us up to the care of devils. So he's saying God's not forsaken us, God hasn't left us, he still cares about us and will support us. And as I do not, I cannot see on what grounds the King of Britain can look up to heaven for help against us. A common murderer, a highwayman, or a housebreaker has as good as pretense as he. So not only does he make the case that uh, America deserves God's help, he makes the case that Britain does not deserve God's help. And so this is what he puts into the minds of the people at that time, that we are in the right, that we are on God's side and God's helping us as we work here. 
Um, Tis surprising to see how rapidly a panic will sometimes run through a country. Now remember, this is a time when people are like, oh, we should give up, we should surrender to Great Britain. Um, you know, because things are bad right now, this is too hard. So he's saying, oh, you know, it surprises me how quickly a panic can happen. Um, all nations and ages have been subject to them. Everybody's had panic times in their history. Britain has trembled like an ague at the report of a French fleet of flat-bottomed boats. And in the 14th uh, century, the whole English army, after ravaging the Kingdom of France, was driven back like men, petrified with fear. And this brave exploit was performed by a few broken forces collected and headed by a woman, Joan of Arc. So he's saying even Britain, this great grand country at one time had, you know, was scared by Joan of Arc. If you don't know that history, the Hundred Years' War there. Um, interesting history you should look into. Um, we don't study it here, but we do study it in the European, uh, European history class. Um, but, you know, he says even Britain has had their times when they should, you know, when, when their great country has been threatened. And America right now is in a time when it's being threatened. Would heaven might inspire some Jersey maid to spirit up her countrymen and save her fell, fell, fair fellow sufferers from ravage and ravishment. So he's saying that same thing could happen here. We could have somebody from New Jersey, some young woman from New Jersey come and rally the people together to make the charge just like Joan of Arc did. He's pointing out that in times of crisis, God sends someone particular to kind of rally the troops and get things going the way that God wants it to go. And that's what he's playing on the minds of the people that, again, we're on God's side and God will help us in this effort. Um, and then he makes a call to action. Here's his call to action. I call not upon a few, but upon all. So he's trying to get all of America together on this. Um, not on this state or that state, but on every state. Up and help us. He's saying, come on, help us. Lay your shoulders to the wheel. Better have too much force than too little when so great an object is at stake. And what's the object at stake? Their freedom. So when freedom's on the line, everybody should join in. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and the country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and repulse it. Say not that thousands are gone, turn out your tens of thousands. Throw not the burden of the day upon providence, but show your faith by your works. He's quoting the Bible there, right? Faith without works is dead. He's saying, if you really believe and you have faith that you're on God's side, get up and help us. Not by the thousands, but by the tens of thousands. And if we exercise that faith, God will help us. So he says, but show your faith by your works that God may bless you. It matters not where you live or what rank of life you hold. The evil or the blessing will reach you all. So it says, doesn't matter who you are. If this goes really well, it will bless everybody in America. If this goes poorly, it will curse us all. The far and the near, the home counties in the back, the rich and the poor will suffer or rejoice alike, depending on what happens in the war. The heart that feels not now is dead. So if you're not excited or impassioned or have feelings about this right now, you're dead. This is, this is important. Everyone should have opinions and feelings on this. The blood of his children will curse his cowardice, who shrinks back at a time when a little might have saved the whole and made them happy. So in other words, if you don't step up and do this now, generations after you will curse you and saying, if you could have done this, it would have blessed our lives forever. So uh, he's encouraging people to come be a part of this blessing. I love the man that can smile in trouble, that can gather strength from distress and grow brave by reflection. Tis the business of little minds to shrink. Shrink in this case means to kind of be afraid and not do anything. But he whose heart is firm and whose conscious appro conscience approves his conduct will pursue his principles unto death. So if you are a strong person, you will push forward even in these hard times. My own line of reasoning is to myself as straight and clear as a ray of light. He says, this is easy for me to see what's going on. Not all the treasures of the world, so far as I believe, could have induced me to support an offensive war. For I think it murder. He says, I, I'm not big on like going and attacking Britain and trying to take them over. An offensive war where you're on offense. He says, that's not what I like. Um... Let's see, for I think it murder, but if a thief breaks into my house, burns and destroys my property, and kills or threatens to kill me, or those that are in it, and to bind me in all cases whatsoever to his absolute will, am I to suffer it? 
So he's comparing Britain coming over and controlling America, controlling colonies, just like if a thief came into your house and tried to steal your stuff and control you. Britain and thieves are just alike. So he says, if a thief breaks into my house, I'm going to protect myself. If Britain tries to control me, I'm going to protect myself. I'm not going to go on the offensive and try to take over their countries, but I am going to defend myself. And it's right, is what he's saying. Let's see. Where am I? Um... Uh, let's see, am I to suffer it? What signifies it to me whether he who does it is a king or a common man? Whether it's a king that tries to steal my stuff or a common thief, it's all the same. Just because a king wants to steal your stuff doesn't make it better. My countrymen or not my countrymen, whether it be done by an individual villain or an army of them, or an army of villains. So it doesn't matter who tries to break into my house and control me, it's all the same. If we reason to the root of things, we shall find no difference. Neither can any just cause be assigned why we should punish the one, uh, punish in the one case and pardon on the other. So if you would punish somebody for breaking into your house, put them in jail, why not if the government tries to break into your house, why would you not try to put the government in jail is basically his argument here. Um, let them call me a rebel and welcome. I feel no concern from it. I don't care whether they think I'm a rebel. I'm just defending myself. But I should suffer the misery of devils were I to make a whore of my soul by swearing allegiance to the one character, uh, to one whose character is that of a sottish, stupid, stubborn, worthless, brutish man. That's what he's calling the king. Pretty strong words. I conceive likewise a horrid idea in receiving mercy from a being who at the last day shall be shrieking at the rocks and mountains to cover him and fleeing with terror from the orphan, the widow, and the slain of America. So he says, why should I be why should I be loyal to the king if, you know, in the next life after he dies, this king is going to be a nobody because he's going to want the rocks to cover him up and begging for mercy because he was not righteous in this life. Why should I be loyal to that king? Um, there are cases which cannot be overdone by language, and this is one. There are persons, too, who see not the full extent of the evil which threatens them. They solace themselves with hopes that the enemy, if he succeed, will be merciful. So he's saying there are some people who say, oh, the king's not going to be that bad to us. He's not really going to control us. He's not really going to take our property. Um, but uh, that's not a good argument, according to uh, Thomas Paine. It is the madness of folly, he calls it, to expect mercy from those who have refused to do justice. So if you expect Britain to be nice to you now, he says, you're crazy. And even mercy, where, where conquest is the object, is only a trick of war. The cunning of the fox is as murderous as the violence of the wolf, and we ought to guard equally against both. I thank God that I fear not. So he's showing his strength, even though the whole country is like, what's going on? This is a hard time. I'm fearful for what's going to happen. He seems, he's putting on a strong face here. I thank God that I fear not. I see no real cause for fear. I know our situation well and can see the way out of it. And what's the way out of it? The way out of it is showing that faith in God and supporting the cause, knowing that God will help us. That's the way he puts it. By perseverance and fortitude, we have the prospect of a glorious issue. Um, that just means that great things will happen if we have perseverance and strength. But by cowardice and submission, the sad choice of a variety of evils, a ravaged country, a depopulated city, habitations without safety, and slavery without hopes. Our homes turned into barracks and body houses for Hessians and a future race to provide for whose fathers we shall doubt of. So he says if we don't do this, uh, he paints the picture there of a, an awful country where, you know, we're just controlled and uh, this, uh, he calls, you know, the variety of evils ravaged country, habitations without safety. That's what's in store for us if we don't show our faith now and support the cause of war. Um, look on this picture and weep over it. And if there yet remains one thoughtless wretch who believes it, let him suffer it unlamented. So that's his call to duty there. And, and the, the real, the whole pamphlet is much larger. This is just an excerpt. But those are some of his main ideas that this is, that America is on God's side. That if we show faith by supporting the word cause, God will help us and uh, we will accomplish something great. Something that is worth the sacrifice and generations after will praise us. Now I think the nice thing is that uh, you can really see how Thomas Paine's words kind of came true. Uh, America died a great place and the freedoms that we enjoy here 
spectacular, huge. They really did bless generations and generations after this. Um, but it took great sacrifice then. And it was these words, among other things, that uh, helped buoy the soldiers, helped them see the purpose of their sacrifice, and helped them push through and be strong. During this time of Valley Forge, which was otherwise a really dark, um, hopeless time when uh, things are, were very discouraging, but America pushed past it and became conquerors in the Revolutionary War.